Well, good afternoon, everyone, and I want to welcome you all to today's Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Forum. I'm Jim Mooney, President and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, and I hope everyone's feeling good today. I feel especially good because today was uh, vaccination number two, um, so felt good. Uh, felt good walking out of uh, the medical center um, with my second vaccination, and I hope that uh, all of you are taking advantage of whatever uh, opportunity you have to get vaccinated as well and encouraging all of your employees and associates to do the same. Um, today, we're joined by Massachusetts Senate President Karen Spilka. Uh, last year's Government Affairs Forum with the Senate President was our first virtual event. Uh, I was thinking back that uh, the normal sequence is the speaker, then speaker uh, of the House, Robert DeLeo was scheduled for March and we were all in that what do we do now moment. So we had to cancel a live event with Speaker DeLeo in March uh, and the Senate President was kind enough to be our first uh, virtual event of the year and that was followed by about 160 more virtual events. So we've really gotten into the business of virtual events. Um, being here a year later and uh, thinking about the past 12 months, I'm sure all of you have reflected on the past year. Um, as I think about the leadership of our state government, we've been fortunate to have a leader like Senate President Spilka, who's followed a collaborative approach on numerous issues of importance to the business community and helped carry us through the health and social crisis of our time. Uh, as I think about Senate President Spilka, I think the term steady hand is appropriate. President Spilka, we're looking forward to hearing from you today. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to begin with a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bank of America, our longstanding partner in these government affairs uh, forum series events. Uh, especially want to thank my friend, Michal Chamberlain, President Bank of America, Massachusetts, and Brian Grip, Public Policy Executive at Bank of America, and the entire team at the bank and help not only helping the chamber bring relevant content to our community, but for the support uh, that they lend to the chamber as well as throughout the greater Boston region and throughout uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I also want to thank our friends at Comcast who helped bring the government affairs forums to a wider audience, uh, including making this event, event available via on demand uh, when we're done. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Please note that today's event is being recorded and will be shared via the Chamber's YouTube page in the coming weeks. And lastly, I want to encourage all participants to utilize the chat and the Q&A functions during today's conversation to ask a question um, that I will uh, put forward to the Senate President when we get to that point in the program. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to the Massachusetts President of Bank of America, Michal Chamberlain, to introduce the Senate President. Thank you, Jim, for the kind introduction, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, we're really so proud of our partnership with the Chamber, and Jim, just a big thank you to you and your team for all you do to convene local leaders and all you do to advocate for the local business community here in Greater Boston. It's very much appreciated by all that are on the line today. It's really hard to believe that we're celebrating our 17th year of sponsoring the Government Affairs Forums, and it's been a great series and one that, again, we're extremely proud to be uh, bringing to life uh, with the Chamber. Uh, on behalf of the bank, it's really my honor to formally introduce today's special guest, uh, Senate President Karen E. Spilka. Senate President Spilka represents the Metro West communities, which comprise uh, the Second Middlesex and Norfolk districts. Senate President Spilka began her legislative career back in 2001, serving as a state representative. And as a senator, she served in several leadership roles, including chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, Senate Majority Whip, and chair of the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technologies, just to name a few. Throughout her career, as Jim said, she's advocated for equal access to a quality, a quality education, championed self-sufficiency, and led statewide regional efforts to make it easier to start, run, and keep a business here in Massachusetts. Since ascending to the Senate presidency, she's taken a collaborative approach to pressing issues facing the Commonwealth, including education, climate change, housing, 
transportation, and mental health care. And of course, most recently, help lead the Commonwealth through the health and social crises of the past year. We're so grateful to have a leader like Senate President Spilka serving the Commonwealth and fortunate to have her with us here this afternoon. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Senate President Spilka. Thank you, Michal. Uh, I'd like to just start out by saying good afternoon and thank you for inviting me here today. I've been asked to please refer to the women behind me. Uh, this is my volume two, year two, of putting women around the Senate president's suite, uh, women who have had a positive and definite impact on the history of Massachusetts. When I came to be Senate president, I realized that there were no paintings or pictures or depictions of women as if women had not had an impact in Massachusetts history. They had been left out, whether it be by accident or design. So we have made the effort to put women up on our wall when you come into the Senate president's suite Instead of the prior Senate presidents, you see 95 fantastic women of color who have had an impact in Massachusetts. So thank you, Michal, for that kind introduction. And thank you so much, Jim, for your leadership of the Boston Chamber and for your ongoing great partnership with the legislature. I'd also like to thank board chair Micho Spring, who inspired us all last year with her concept of going forward to work, as well as the members of the chamber, especially for your re recent efforts to increase the number of women on boards, a longstanding goal of mine as well. Thank you. And I'd like to also thank the staff of the chamber. We have seen how willing our staff have been to pivot during these extraordinary times and I always feel it's important to acknowledge that. So thank you. And of course, I'd like to also recognize and thank my colleagues in the Senate who have joined us this afternoon. And there may be some House members. I know in particular, uh, Senator Rush was going to come on. There's other hearings and I think there might be others. So I just wanna thank you for taking the time. As we enter year two of a very difficult pandemic, I have been reflecting on what we have learned over the past year. And I am heartened to report that Massachusetts was prepared for this unprecedented crisis in many ways. Working together, the legislature and the Baker administration hit pause on the state budget process for fiscal year 2021. So we can gain a better understanding of where we would be financially. And there was wisdom in waiting because we were able to pass a sound budget that makes investments in key areas to plan our economic recovery while avoiding new taxes and the drastic COVID related budget cuts that were predicted by so many. This was possible because for many years now, our state has worked hard to save responsibly for the rainy day we are now experiencing. The legislature has also been intentional since the great recession of 2008 to pass policies that promote the diversification of our sectors and industries, allowing us to weather our current situation better. In addition, the Senate's solid working relationship with business and labor, as Jim has referred to, forged during years of collaboration, allowed us to move quickly recently on making changes to UI rates and bringing the taxation of the Paycheck Protection Program loans in line with the federal guidelines. A very important piece of this mini grand bargain, as I refer to it, remains unresolved, however, and that is the emergency paid sick time, 
that I laid out as a Senate priority just three months ago in January. Our essential workers continue to need paid leave while they are still at risk of contracting COVID or need to quarantine or recover from receiving a vaccination. And so I hope the governor will sign this important provision expeditiously. Despite the many challenges we face this year, I'm proud to say that we passed economic development, IT and transportation bond bills. We worked hard to get a strong police reform bill that puts us on a path to racial equity signed into law. And thanks to a strong partnership with the new speaker, Ron Mariano, I give a shout out to him. We sent a landmark next gen climate change bill to the governor. And we have kicked off our 2022 budget discussions by the Senate and the House committing to fully funding the Student Opportunity Act. While we were able to complete some very important work, we must also acknowledge that COVID-19 has thrown into stark relief many persistent and inequitable gaps that exist in our society. It has also presented us with a rare opportunity and a responsibility to reimagine the path forward towards what I call back to better by addressing those gaps head on. I have been particularly struck by the statistics on the devastating effects of COVID-19 that it's had on women in the workplace. Before the pandemic, women in Massachusetts were participating in the workforce at increasing rates, even surpassing the national rate by 2019. But unfortunately, the pandemic has brought women back to where they were after the 2009 recession. In fact, the percentage of women participating in the US labor market in October of 2020 was the lowest, the absolute lowest since 1988. It is clear to me that if we wish to have a full and equitable recovery, we must take a close look at the factors that affect women's employment at every level and in every sector. And one clear factor that we must address is caregiving. In the same way that we learned to diversify our sectors after the last recession, we are now learning that we must support and strengthen the caregiving sector in Massachusetts so that we can support working families across our Commonwealth. Almost exactly one year ago today, as Jim noted, I appeared before this chamber in what was your first ever virtual forum. It's hard to believe hundreds of forums, thousands possibly for some of you. I declared that childcare was as important to our infrastructure as roads and bridges in getting people back to work. The struggles of the past year have borne this out, which is why I have pushed the legislature to begin to address the need for childcare, including providing for emergency childcare for essential workers, increasing rates for early education providers and dedicating specifically $40 million for a new reserve to cover parent fees for those receiving subsidized childcare. We also established the Early Education and Care Economic Review Commission to review childcare funding and make recommendations on policy changes to expand quality and access. With the promise of over $500 million in federal funding through the American Rescue Plan, we are well poised to make more strides in making childcare more accessible and affordable. 
And I look forward to working with all of you to dedicate our best thinking towards tackling this problem, both in the public and the private sectors. But childcare is just one piece of what many are calling a caregiving crisis, a storm that has been brewing on our horizon for a few years, but which COVID-19 has turned into a full-blown tsunami. Many people, mostly women, who work in non-caregiving professions, but are sandwiched between aging parents and growing children, have dropped out of the workforce in alarming numbers to care for those who rely upon them. While too many black and brown women who work in caregiving professions have been just crushed by the job losses of the economic downturn with devastating results for their families and their communities. As we all feel the squeeze of this caregiving crisis, is it any surprise that we are facing a mental health crisis as well? But this is Massachusetts, my friends, and I know we can do better. President Biden has identified the caregiving economy as a top priority, most recently in his infrastructure plan. With luck, there will be significant investment in caregiving from early education and childcare to elder care and care for people with varying abilities from the federal government in the coming months and hopefully years. This is our shot to be a national leader in transforming the way we support caregivers and care workers and build a thriving economy that works for everyone. That's why I am proposing here today that we steward federal and state dollars to create a system of intergenerational care that provides a way to support, connect, and integrate community-based care across all ages. With the goal of making intergenerational care accessible and affordable to all, while supporting the workforce to make this possible. What does this look like? Well, I'm not entirely sure yet, but I do know that we have a problem to solve and we've tackled difficult challenges similar to this before. In the economic development reform bill we passed after the great recession, I helped to create regional economic development organizations or redos as we call them that for the first time provided a front door for businesses to access the many programs and services offered by the Commonwealth. Similarly, to keep children out of the juvenile justice system, in 2015, I created the Family Resource Centers, or FRCs, which also created a single point of entry where children and families could access basic services such as behavioral and mental health or housing support if needed. Both Redo's and FRC's have proven that this type of one-stop shop for services can be very successful. With FRC's proving to be especially vital during the COVID-19 crisis but they currently only support families with children under the age of 18. I would like to see us expand and build upon the successful FRC model to create intergenerational care centers where everyone, no matter what age, can access information about childcare, elder care, and before and after school programs, as well as services for residents at all stages of life and all levels of ability, 
including, of course, mental and behavioral health support. At the very least, these intergenerational care centers can act as a front door to help overburdened family members access information about and referrals to everything from childcare to elder care with perhaps more ambitious goals eventually, such as the co-location of childcare, elder care, and care for those with disabilities in one community-based center, or caregivers credentialed to work in more than one area or other innovative ideas to be implemented at some time in the future. Now is the time to be bold and think creatively, because as I've said, we have the opportunity as well as the responsibility to not only invest in our re <laughs> recovery, but to th rethink and rebuild our communities with connection in mind. Excuse me. <clears throat> which I believe will lead to better physical, emotional, and public health outcomes over time. <coughs> Too often, I believe government tends to only do short-term planning and not long-term. But I'd like to take this opportunity to propose our moonshot long-term planning intergenerational care centers, which may not be realized until years in the future. But there are steps that we can take now to lay this important foundation for the future vision of caregiving. Starting with shining a bright light on the needs of the caregiving workforce. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, women make up at least 80% of the workers in the health and social assistance industry, with women of color making up a growing percentage of this workforce. Despite the truly essential nature of these jobs, after all, we have to acknowledge you simply cannot outsource a home health aid position. You cannot outsource the work of the person caring for your family member with disabilities. These jobs continue to be undervalued and underpaid. We can change this and build the kind of intergenerational care infrastructure we all deserve. But we have to fully understand the problem first. And that's why I'm asking Adam Hines, the chair of the Senate Committee on Reimagining Massachusetts Post-Pandemic Resiliency, to hold a listening session on the caregiving workforce, with a special emphasis on the economic impact of COVID-19 on women of color in this workforce. We, so that we can collect more data on this crucial sector and center black and brown women in our economic recovery plan. According to Janelle Jones, the chief economist, economist at the Labor Department under President Biden, when black women benefit from economic polities, everyone does. There is too often a steep climb to economic recovery for many black and brown women who are subject to what economic uh, economist Michelle Holder calls the double gap, undercompensation because of two types of discrimination in wages, both racial and gender. Centering women of color in our economic recovery means that we can tackle some of the most persistent and damaging inequities facing Massachusetts today, while putting us on a path towards stronger communities, better quality of caregiving for all those who need it, 
and a much stronger economic recovery for all. While we listen to the voices of the women who have been most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that there are areas that we can focus on now. We can ensure that people are getting the training they need to fill the in-demand jobs in the caregiving sector, either through vocational or mid-career training and retraining. We can work towards providing living wages, comprehensive benefits, and safe working conditions for all care workers to prevent the enormous amount of turnover that happens in these fields. We can find ways to support the mental health and the well being of everyone working in the caregiving job so that they don't give up these jobs for something else less demanding. And we can continue to talk about the importance of this sector so that these workers, those that care for our young children, our aging parents, and our friends and family members with disabilities no longer feel invisible. This is a challenge for all of us, both in the public sector and the private sector, but I know we can do it. As I have said throughout this pandemic, we are all in this together. I refuse to accept an unequal recovery where some of us do just fine while others take decades to return to a status quo that may not have been so great to begin with. That's not how we do things in a commonwealth, especially when we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to reimagine our post pandemic future. I am committed to doing the work of ma to make our Commonwealth stronger, more resilient, and more equitable. And I hope, and I invite you to join me in finding creative ways to strengthen our caregiving economy and build the intergenerational care infrastructure of our future. Before I close, though, I'd like to mention something that's been on my mind lately as well. As we come closer to Memorial Day, I have been thinking about my father and what he experienced as a veteran with untreated mental illness and the fact that some active and former service members continue to experience high levels of mental illness. As we rethink caregiving overall and honor the sacrifices of our veterans, we must also rethink how we deliver the care to veterans of every generation across Massachusetts. And as the Senate and House announced last week, we plan to work on reforming assistance to all veterans in every region of our Commonwealth ensuring that our veterans are connected to their communities is an important factor in ensuring that their physical and their mental health is taken care of. And so I look forward to working with the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Veterans and Federal Affairs, Senator John Velas, as well as Ways and Means Chair, Michael Rodericks, and Senators Rush and Cronin, an active service member and a veteran, respectively, on new initiatives for our veterans, such as funding for workforce training, targeting specialized community-based mental health for veterans and service members, and focusing on the needs of women who make up at least 7% of our veteran population right here in Massachusetts, as well as the LGBTQ vets and veterans of color. As we work our way through 2021, the first year of a two-year session and the second year of a pandemic, please know that the Senate will continue to also focus on our biggest challenges, 
including racial equity, transportation, housing, education, economic development, workforce training, mental health, and climate. At the same time, as we reimagine what is possible in Massachusetts, we will be bold. We, of course, welcome your continued partnership and your ideas, because together we will go back to better. Thank you very much. Please stay healthy and be well. Well, thank you, um, Senate President Spilka, for a very powerful and um, for your very powerful and thoughtful remarks uh, today. Um, I want to begin by uh, both thanking your father for his service to our country, um, but also for acknowledging your um, steady and continued focus uh, on veterans uh, here in Massachusetts. I've heard you speak. Uh, of our veterans and making sure we don't forget many times. And um, I want you to know that uh, the chamber, the business community and our veterans appreciate that leadership. Um, so um, intergenerational care centers, um, you know, what a concept, um, uh, very exciting. And um, I'm sure that uh, we'll have an opportunity to work with Senator Hines as he uh, embarks on giving it some definition. Um, you, you mentioned that, you mentioned childcare, you mentioned uh, women's participation in the workforce. And I think I know the answer because as I said in my introduction and Michal said that, you know, you're a collaborator and you, you, you're very good at connecting the dots between the various constituencies uh, here in Massachusetts. And certainly the business community is focused on many issues, but talent, a talented workforce and skills and making sure that we have the human resources um, to continue to thrive as an economy here in Massachusetts. But you chose a chamber of commerce to bring these issues to the fore. So connect the dots for me. Why, you know, why is this, uh, why is it important to the business community to focus on these issues that, uh, that you chose to focus on today? I believe for several reasons and thanks, that's a great question. Aside from the fact I know the chamber likes new proposals um, and, and you know this is something that I look forward to as well and we have been thinking and talking about this concept and seriously COVID has brought this to the forefront. We need to ensure that we get women back in the workforce and don't leave if they're still in the workforce. It was very depressing to me to find out that we are we have lost in one year of COVID a full decade of progress that women have made this last decade. We are back, as I said, back to 1988 with our participation. And that is more than sad and disappointing. That is, I think, outrageous. And we all need to take action to help stop not only stem that tide, but bring women back. Uh, we know, I mean, if people want to run a business and just look at their bottom line, you need a rich and diverse workforce to bring many thoughts and ideas and talents into the, the picture. Uh, all research shows that businesses' bottom lines do much better when women and you know, women of color participate in the business. There's a richer uh, array of thoughts, ideas, suggestions uh, that are made. And it's, it's a fact the business does better. So if you're just going to look at your bottom line, that alone should be sufficient reason to make sure that we get women back into the workforce. And we do develop this intergenerational care system so that not only will women benefit, but men and clearly families and communities. Uh, I, I think that that is the, clearly the long-term goal for everybody. And I think it's important, I mean, women, you know, clearly look at the pictures around me. There were a hell of a lot more than 95 women that, you know, the ones on the wall, 
but there were so many more that we could have put up. I'm, I'm sort of looking forward to next year even to have another assortment um, and maybe expanding it out even into the hallways of this of the, the state house. But uh, you know, it, it just I think we need to really highlight the successes of all of our residents and women clearly are a force. Well, uh, thank you for that answer. And I and I, I share the uh, the belief and it, you know, grounded in uh, whether it's the bottom line or the ability to attract um, the most talented people. I mean, that's that's our competitive advantage here in Massachusetts, and we can't right. leave, can't leave anyone on the sidelines. And and if we've had a setback, as you described in COVID, with women's participation, it's especially important that we we think about that. I think equally important is your focus um, on uh, on people that are aging. Uh, I think the statistic is 10,000 people a day for the next 12 years and the baby boomer generation turning 65. Um, so all sorts of questions about their participation in the workforce or their need for care um, that will affect business operations. So um, uh, my gratitude for connecting all of these dots in terms of our, how our economy uh, works. Um, and we look forward to partnering. As we've said many times, uh, government's not going to solve all these things alone and business communities right. are ready to be a partner. Right. Um, I did want to acknowledge your, um, in your remarks, you, you talked about working together and strong partnerships and even uh, had a shout out for uh, the, new, uh, the new speaker, Ron Mariano. And, um, you know, people on this call and people at the chamber that do work that we do are always interested in sort of the leadership triangle under the Golden Dome. Uh, you and the speaker have sent some pretty strong signals that you, you intend to work together and collaboratively. Um, so, you know, how's it going? You, you're breaking them into that wall pretty good? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the new speaker is, is, has been around the block a few times as well. Um, so I'm not certain that any breaking in is necessary. But uh, I, I do believe that um, he's a collaborator as well, uh, which I so appreciate. I feel so strongly that we need to work together, the House, the Senate, and the governor and, and administration. We don't always agree, and we won't always agree. That, that's just not possible. But to be able to talk about the issues, to talk about what we agree with and what we do not agree with, and try to get to yes on an issue, I think that is indicative of our end of session. We were able to accomplish a lot. We got a tremendous amount of work done and we were able to get the next gen climate change bill to the governor's desk quickly and resolve it. And I do believe that other issues, you know, we, we will be bringing forward. Certainly we may say that we're bringing forward an issue and then we bring it to, he brings it to his respective house members. I'll bring it to the Senate members and each chamber will stamp its own identity on the issue and add or subtract things but then we will work it out. And, you know, just like with the budget, we were able to agree uh, the two chairs of Ways and Means working really well together, uh, the Senate chair, Senator Mike Rodericks, and the House chair, Aaron Michaelwitz, agree on a local aid statement on agreeing on the amount that our uh, cities and towns will get of unrestricted local aid. And then the chapter 70 and the agreement to fully fund, to break it down into a six year implementation instead of seven year, because we could not do it for the 2021, but we still intend to fully fund a seven year implementation of the Student Opportunity Act. Our students need that funding now. So uh, I, I believe that, that you know, we will continue to work well together. Um, a follow-up, uh, you mentioned uh, the budget, and uh, we expect that um, House Ways and Means will release their budget tomorrow, uh, so we'll see sort of what's in that. Um, um, a couple of questions maybe on process and revenue assumptions. I know that the consensus revenue was sort of derived a couple of months ago, and you know we now have the benefit of first quarter results and 
uh, and so forth, as well as um, some influx of federal monies. Um, a couple of questions: How does the how does the performance of the budget over the first quarter of this calendar year, or since the revenue projections were derived at, along with the federal money, um, influence the budget? And do you expect it to be a basically normal process from a timing perspective this year? Uh, thank you for that question. I think the timing might be the only normal thing because, um, and I'm hoping, I mean, the House, yes, they're coming out with their budget tomorrow. Amendments will be due. They'll be debating their budget after uh, school vacation week. We will be doing the same thing towards the end of May and then trying to hash out the differences in June. Uh, this, this is a different year, not, not the same as last year when we did for 2021, which was a most difficult budget, but it, it is either, I think, complicated by um, several factors, the pan, well, several. Our revenues are uh, surpassing any of the projections that, that were made by the economists that we meet with, uh, and we met with them several times for in preparation for this current budget, uh, and it still is surpassing. And again, I go back to the intentional nature that the legislature had in making sure that our economy was diversified, that we had different sectors to, to rely upon uh, and was healthy to uh, bounce back better and faster than we did the last recession. So we learned and we took that into account. Um, so we are doing better. Uh, we also will be getting a lot of federal dollars. Uh, we had some from uh, the first round of the CARES Act, and then we had another round in, in December, and now we're getting the ARPA uh, funding, which we still are awaiting um, information from the federal government as to how we can use that. We're not certain. Some of it can be extended for several years, two or three years, so we don't need to use it all now, which is good so that we can plan. But we also have to keep in mind that that money, which may amount to billions of dollars in some areas, will not be sustainable in the long run. So we need to make key investments that will help grow our economy, protect the health and safety of our residents, um, and, and make sure that we use it in the right way. I am hoping that some of that, the funds, whether they be, you know, some of the state funds can be um, put back in to replenish our rainy day fund. You know, that was also a very conscious decision to, to grow our rainy day fund. And we were lucky, we were, one of the we were one of the states in the best position because we had one of the larger rainy day funds percentage wise to our annual budget. So we use some, I'm hoping this year uh, we can not use as much and, and maybe even start replenishing it because as we learned with COVID, we will have rainy days and some of them will be very rainy and difficult. So we need, we need to once again plan both short term and I believe long term for our fiscal stability. Mm -hmm. Senate President, you, you, you noted all the different forms of federal monies coming in um, and the need to make sure that we use it wisely <clears throat> so that we're not looking back two and three years from now and regretting some things. Um, what's the role of the legislature in determining how this money gets used? Is it is this mostly a administration function or is it a, how will that all unfold in terms of the uses of the funds that come from the federal government? Uh, it varies depending upon what bucket it comes from. There are buckets that will come from the federal government and go directly to school districts for K to 12 or directly to uh, higher ed or um, cities and towns. There's local aid that the state will not have uh, a whole lot of say on. We can give advice and guidance and suggestions and work with some of the cities and towns who may not have had access to this 
kind of funding in the past. There's some that goes to counties, you know, some we still have some counties and there's some that will go to counties and some for transportation and other areas. And then there will be, you know, several billion dollars we're being told that will go to the state um, for allocation for different things that, you know, we created in the budget this year a trust fund for some of those dollars to go into so the legislature will have a say in some of that disbursement. Um, clearly, I believe that we'll need to hear from stakeholders and people across the Commonwealth. I'll, I want to hear from uh, the senators as well. Um, and we need to, to keep in mind that uh, what we allocate, and certainly working with the administration, the governor, the secretary of administration and finance, you know, we, we need, for the, for the good of the residents of the Commonwealth, we need to really be working together on this uh, and not just shooting from our hip or sending money out to something. We really need to be thoughtful and deliberative in planning this out. So uh, we do have a question that offers a, um, a potential opportunity for use of CARES funding. Um, first quarter unemployment insurance bills are going out and you know we certainly appreciate uh, and are pleased about the rate freeze. Um, there is surprise and sticker shock over the increase in the solvency assessment to cover the pool of workers not assigned to a specific employer. Um, we know the Senate was as surprised uh, as employers about the size of the assessment. Uh, one path that the chamber and others have advocated Four is using some of the new federal funding or some of the CARES Act funding to help defray the cost as has been done in other states. Um, what do you think about uh, that idea? Or alternatively, is there a way to spread the assessment over a couple of years? You know, as you noted, uh, the sticker shock surprised a lot of people, including uh, the Senate. We, when we did the UI bill, um, over the course of the last few months and had the hearing even last session on it, uh, we nobody raised this issue of the solvency fund and the, and the potential increase. So it was a surprise. So right now I feel we are listening. We are gathering information, uh, finding out different ways to uh, work with our, our uh, partners and our, our businesses and others across the Commonwealth. And I think it's important that we uh, work with our federal partners to ensure what we can and cannot do with the federal monies that we are, are getting. So, you know, at this point, you know, I, I feel like we are still in an information gathering mode, but I realize uh, the hardship that this places on many businesses. Right. Um, well, uh, you know, it, uh, it wouldn't be a conversation unless we talked about the MBTA. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of transportation related questions. Uh, what's your thinking on the performance of the MBTA as it pertains to getting ready for um, more people coming back to work and returning to the office. Uh, and a second question is, in last year's transportation bond bill, a special commission on mobility and roadway pricing uh, was recommended or, or passed by the legislature uh, that would re-examine um, issues like tolling throughout the Commonwealth, um, an issue especially important to your district, Governor Baker vetoed it. Um, and now in light of the um, of the climate change bill, which puts us on a path to uh, less reliance on the gas tax over time, it just seems more important that we, as you said in your remarks, have some long-term planning on, on this issue. Um, so what are your thoughts on the MBTA's performance generally, I guess, in getting ready for the return and um, uh, any thoughts on maybe trying to get that uh, mobility commission up and running again? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for whoever asked this. Transportation is an issue near and dear to my heart. And I have consistently said it's important that we get people out of their cars and into public transportation for congestion, for environmental reasons, for quality of life. 
um, and, and for so many different reasons. Uh, I, I am happy that the MBTA reversed its decision of its cuts for both uh, inner city and, and commuter uh, rail programs. I do believe that we are beginning to come back. People are beginning to uh, work less remotely and come back to work. Um, I can attest to that. Uh, the last week when I, I was in the state house, um, normally it had been taking me this last year, 35 minutes, maybe 40 minutes door to door. I actually hit my first traffic jam in a year. It was both, it was bittersweet actually, because it's nice to know that people are coming back to work. On the other hand, it took me over an hour, uh, which is just slowly building up to the at least hour and a half each way that it used to take me. Um, so I think we need to prepare. If we cut back on service, I learned this early in my district, Framingham had bus service. It was the only part of my district that had some sort of bus service paid for partly by Framingham and other and the MBTA paid for this. This is like in the 90s and 2000s. And whenever funding was tight in the MBTA, they cut the service for this bus and it stopped. And then it would come, we'd lobby and we'd work hard as a delegation, get the funding back, get the buses back to, to riding. And it would take a long time to build it back up because it was unpredictable. People didn't know always that it had restarted. And it was a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. The MBTA would say, well, there's not that many people using the bus right now. And there wasn't because it was constantly being cut. It was not reliable and predictable um, as people needed it. So I believe that if we do start doing that with the MBTA or the commuter, commuter rail, people will just get in their cars or, or figure out other ways if possible. Um, and I think we need to make public transportation more reliable, affordable, accessible. We need to start increasing certain ones rather than decreasing. So I would support that. And I believe the commission is important on congestion pricing. I believe, uh, I know Senator Boncori has worked on a lot of these issues as Senate Chair of Transportation on uh, what we can do for low income riders. And there were, uh, there were pilot programs um, for concerning uh, fares for uh, lower fares or no fares for low income riders that we need to be uh, looking at. Again, we need to figure out ways to get people uh, out of their cars and into public transportation. But we also need to make sure that our roads and bridges are well maintained, are safe, because people will continue to use them. But we should prioritize public transportation. Um, thank you. You know, I always like to talk about transportation issues. Um, we have another question in another one of my favorite industries, but but the one that um, uh, was um, hit hardest uh, by this COVID, hospitality, tourism, our hotels, our restaurants, uh, industry that has the third largest number of employees uh, in normal times anyway in the, in the Commonwealth. Um, so, you know, an industry that, that is not only high in worker numbers, but contributes much in form of tax revenue legislature held an impact hearing last week on the industry. Um, what are your thoughts on next steps or what the state can do to, to aid this uh, particularly hard hit industry during the economic recovery? Well, you know, I, I think that we need to, once again, my first response is meeting with the stakeholders, meeting with the restaurant industry and the workers uh, to find out once again at this point in time, because it has been changing over the last year by month, month to month. Um, I do think uh, people are going back to, to eating inside. I have to say, we ate our first meal inside a restaurant recently. It was wonderful. It was great. Um, it was a local family owned restaurant in Ashland and we've done a lot of takeout. Uh, trying to support our, our local restaurants. Um, and I think it's important to hear from them what more, what more help do they need. 
There, uh, through the funding that we got uh, last year, uh, we set aside hundreds of millions of dollars for business, particularly small businesses and restaurants. We put another uh, tens of millions, I think it was 20 million um, in our in the Senate version of the Economic Development Bill and it, it survived conference for specifically restaurants. Um, and I think as the way, so I think that restaurants I'm hoping are aware that this assistance is there to help them if they aren't opened yet inside or outside to make sure that they can get the supplies they need, whether it be the, the plastic pa panels to put at a bar so that people can sit at the bar, uh, the, the tables to have more eating outside um, or whatever it is that's needed to uh, help facilitate the reopening. I do uh, hope that our communities are um, generous with the restaurants and small businesses in their communities. I do think they are, but you know, if there are permits that are needed, maybe waive the cost of the permits even if possible. Whatever we can do to reasonably help our restaurants and small businesses, I think we need to strongly consider. Right. Um, Madam President, I'm going to close with an education question. I know you've been vocal about uh, robust funding and strategy needed to support students, teachers, staff uh, throughout the Commonwealth and our education system. I guess looking back, how have we done and how do you envision uh, our, our education systems um, um, performing or executing an equitable recovery and you know a lot of our our kids uh, essentially lost a year um, what are your thoughts on that um, I am very concerned about a lost year plus of education for for our kids um, I believe that it has been some districts have done great and some not as well. Some of it is dependent upon the resources available to the district, to the, the schools, the ages of the schools, uh, what kind of HVAC systems did they have? What kind of desks in elementary school? Many elementary schools had, individ had long tables for desks. Now that we need to space kids at least three feet apart, you need individual desks. I mean, there's so many specifics. My son is a high school history teacher in the New York City public schools. Uh, and so I, I talk to him regularly and I hear from him. He loves what he does, but he is burnt by, by the amount of time and energy. For months, it was remote classes. Then it was partial in school, partial remote. It has been a really difficult year for our teachers and hats off to all of the teaching staff and all the employees at K to 12 schools, at early education and care centers and public higher ed as well. It has been possibly the most difficult year of teaching and learning uh, that I can ever, that in my lifetime at least, uh, I can't go beyond that, but at least in my lifetime, um, the circumstances and teachers and students and staff have beyond risen to the occasion. So I, I applaud them, thank them from the bottom of my heart. But still with that, there has been tremendous learning loss for our students and socially and emotionally has been really trying. I am hoping that you know we can direct more funding towards the social and emotional well-being of our students. We can have as many classes this summer on learning loss curriculum, academics, math, English, whatever, many, you know, accelerated weeks of, of learning or direction after school, even into next fall unless we address the social and emotional learning of our children at all ages, the academic portion just, I believe, will not follow in the way that we all hope it would. So I think that, you know, even with this summer, if there's more summer school, there has to be a portion of not, you can't just do academics. It has to be so 
you um, you went off to um, you. Not, oh, there was, <laughs> Is that a okay. hint? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we didn't do that. I don't know, but bottom line is you have to address the social and emotional needs of our kids at the same time or even before you do the academic. Well, uh, on that note, uh, Senate President Karen Spilka, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Um, and, and all of your comments and uh, the Chamber of the Business Community looks forward to continuing our close working relationship towards all of the issues that you raised today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the chamber. Great to see you. Thank you, Jim. Before we close, a note about our next Government Affairs Forum, which will feature Attorney General Maura Haley on June 19th. I hope you'll join us for that event. And in the meantime, on May 19th, we'll host our largest event of the year, our 2021 annual meeting. This year, we're honoring Paul Grogan of the Boston Foundation, Melvin Miller, the founder of the Bay State Banner, and Kate Walsh, the CEO of Boston Medical Center Health System, uh, with an induction of each of them into our Academy of Distinguished Bostonians. Uh, if you're interested in participating in that event, please contact the Chamber team. Uh, it's not too late to sign up. And once again, thank you all for joining us. And that concludes today's session.